How's the family this morning? We're glad you're here. I want to thank the band, the mini band. <laughs> we uh, were supposed to add someone for special music, and uh, they didn't make it. And uh, David Taylor told me this past week that he was going to be over here, so I asked him then. I said, hey, would you bring some of that special cowboy poetry with you and do that for us? And then I got a call from Nick and said, well, we have special music. So I called David back, and I said, well, I guess we really don't need that this week. We already got special music, and look, God lined it up for us anyway. Amen? Thank you, David. We appreciate it. Right here on the eve of Thanksgiving, um, we all have much to be thankful for and to uh, reflect on with families and friends at this time. And today's message should not be overlooked or disregarded in any way. If you heed the words that are spoken here today, they can alter how we live our lives today and every day the rest of our lives. Don't take it for granted. Today's message is a reminder, a word of warning and caution for those who are busy living from day to day. They forget how completely fragile and uncertain life can be. Turn with me. We'll pick up this morning in James. We're going to chapter 4. Verse 13. James chapter 4. Begin at verse 13. Now listen. You who say, today or tomorrow we will go to this or that city, spend a year there, carry on business, and make money. Why, you do, not, you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that, have, that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Right to the point. Simply stated this way, that James says, our lives are like a mist. Here today and gone tomorrow. Here one minute and gone the next. And if you look around at the world today, or if you look at just your own little part of the world, your own particular life, you'll see the word from James is true. Very true. There are loved ones whose presence is at the center of our lives. And as our own breath, one day we look around and death has snatched them away from us. The book of James reminds us that we should not take tomorrow for granted. We should, put, we should not put off something to a later time, especially those that they're a matter of the spirit in our hearts. Each of us needs to resolve in our lives, don't put off for tomorrow what needs to be done today is what we're getting at. The question that I have for you today is your house in order? Is your soul right with God? And are you living today in such a way that it is apparent that you understand that you can be here today and be gone tomorrow? Are you aware of that in your life every minute of the day that you live. One question I'd have for you today. Did you come here today to feel good. Or did you come here today to feel God. Because if you came here today to feel good. Feelings aren't what it's about. Feeling God is what it's about. Amen. I ask you today. What is your life? What kind of legacy. Will you leave behind? You see. The tragedy of life is not that it ends too soon, but that we wait so long for it to begin in our lives. Each one of us, at any time, are subject to having situations and circumstances in our lives. That never changes. James knew this to be true. So he wanted some lessons to be learned and some new attitudes. That's a good word. New attitudes that should be adopted from this day forward. Because some of our attitudes are out of line with what God asks us to do. 
and what God asks us to be. It is by God's will and not our own that we are able to face each new day in our life. It is sinful to think that we can accomplish anything in life without God's gracious assistance. The greatest sin of all is not is to know the good that we should do during our short lives. The greatest sin of all is, is to know the good that we should do during our short lives. And it's not because we're putting it off till later. We need to know the good that we're impacting to everybody else today. Don't wait till later to say, hey, I'm going to do a good thing in my life for this person, or I'm going to take that time to spend with my kids. I'm going to take that time to spend with my family sometime. It's today that counts because we're only a miss. We're only here for a short period of time. And we take for granted that tomorrow will come. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee in the Bible that tomorrow will be here. So we need to take the time today and quit putting it off of something we need to do, something we need to correct in our lives, some sin we need to fix that's going on in our life, something going on in a relationship with somebody that needs to be fixed today before it's too late, before you don't have that opportunity. I visit with people all the time that have regrets of things they did not do before losing a loved one. Don't have any of those regrets. Clear those up today. We're headed toward the holidays. We're headed toward Thanksgiving. Be thankful of the people in your lives. Be thankful that what God has awarded you with and trusted you with and make it known. Some of you today may not realize it or not. You may not even have thought of it this way. But it's not your alarm clock that wakes you up every day. Your alarm clock can ring all day long, all night. But if God does not reach down and wake you up with his love, your clock is no good to you at all. James tells us that it's by God's will, not ours, that we go about our daily task. It is God's will that gives us the ability to earn our daily bread. It's God's will that our dreams are fulfilled, our prayers are answered, our fears are overcome, and our lives each, uh, unfold each and every day. God's will only, not ours. The Lord has blessed all of you that are here today because you're here today. Amen? Thank God for that. Thank God for the graciousness that he reached down and woke you up this morning to be part of this world one more day. Your life and your death is not about your job, your wealth, or your possessions. It's about what you leave behind, not what you're going to take with you. It's about the legacy that you leave behind that reflects God and God's values. This poem makes that point. I have only just a minute. Only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, didn't choose it, didn't seek it, can't refuse it, so it's up to me to use it. Have to suffer if I lose it, pay a price if I abuse it, just a tiny minute, minute, but eternity is in it. Amen. Turn with me to Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter 6, begin at verse 6. Deuteronomy chapter 6, being at verse 6. These co commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on your door frames of your houses and on your great gates. We're talking about the commandments, God's commandments. How easy it is for us to bend and twist God's commandments in today's society. That they really don't apply, and I've heard that said over and over again, they really don't apply to this day and time. The Bible never changes. 
person tells you that, that's not true. God's commandments then are the same commandments now. And they should be abided by. You say, well, I can't do that because I'm not perfect. I understand that. But are you striving to do it or are you blowing them off? Are you twisting them to fit you? Because it happens all the time. Well, that commandment really don't apply to me. I, You know, it really says this because I'm doing this, it makes it okay. It doesn't make it okay. If you believe that, then you're out of line with God's word. God's commandments are the same today. Basically, Deuteronomy tells us to live and share God's commandments with everyone. Don't act like they don't mean anything to you in your life. Live out the commandments so other people can see. In Exodus 20, God tells Moses, I lavish my love on those who love me and obey my commands, even for a thousand generations. He's not talking about just us. He's talking about the commands that we leave, live and leave, leave behind us to our children and our grandchildren and generations beyond. What kind of example are you setting for your family, their, their inheritance down the road? It's not about the money. It's not about the possessions. It's about the Word of God being placed in each and everyone's heart. And if we're not doing that, we are failing our job as Christians because we are commanded to do that. There are two ways that your legacy will be revealed to your children, grandchildren, other generations, and others. Two ways to do that. Really, really simple. And I like visuals. This is a can of air freshener. For breeze, in fact. But if you spray it, you're only a mist. But you know, in that mist that I just sprayed, this one says spring flowers. So we know when that mist disappears... There's a lovely scent left behind for everybody to enjoy. You know, there's something else that sprays a scent called a skunk. And if you've ever smelled a skunk, you know what I'm talking about. That's a mist also, but what it leaves behind is awful. It's an awful smell. And your legacy is the same way. You can either leave a good scent behind or you can leave a bad one. It applies to us, too, in the same way. What does it look like? What do people say about us when we're gone? Was that a good Christian guy? Was that a good Christian woman? Or are they saying, man, that person was so out of line with God. I'm glad I didn't live like them. I don't think we should say that. I think that's when we need to be praying for that person that we see that way before they're gone. That's when we need to impel something into their heart, a word of God that will turn them from those awful ways back to good ways. But it's by God's word only that that can happen, not by our own. What are you leaving behind for your children, grandchildren, and the generations after that? What are you doing in your life that would turn them away from God? And not toward God. You know a good workman knows that it takes time to build a home. Especially a home that will last for decades. He skillfully goes out and lays out the groundwork. And he refuses to cut corners. As he pieces together a solid frame. When you cut corners that's what you get. You get, a, you get something that's just going to fall apart in no time. Many of you builders here know exactly what I'm talking about. But in the same way, we need to build a spiritual foundation in the next generation. You see all these protests going on right now in our country. And this protest is because kids nowadays don't know God. And they don't know how to lose. We've got to make sure everybody's a winner. We've got to make sure everybody is good. And they feel good about themselves. Because if they don't, then they're not going to succeed in society. You know what they're doing? They're standing by waiting on us to provide to them because they don't have God and they don't know how to succeed in society. Turn it back around. Put it back in God's hands. I take issue with that. I pray that my kids grow up knowing how to work hard, put their hand to the plow, and think and use some common sense when you do something. If you're not teaching your kids in that way, you're out of step with God's Word. There are things that happen to people all the time. There are things that happen that 
hinder people from being able to succeed. But I've seen people handicapped in chair handicapped in chairs with barely any body functions that are succeeding in life because they have the they have the drive from God to succeed in life. If you don't have a drive from God to do anything, then why do it? What purpose is it? Self, it's for yourself. It's not for anybody else. The Bible's real clear. It's not about us. It's about the other. And that's what we should be instilling in our kids. Think of the other person. Don't be selfish and think about me. I'm going to tell you, when I first got married and I was growing up, I was probably the most selfish person in the world. My wife told me that all the time. It was all about me. What I wanted, when I wanted it, and how I wanted it. That's what it was about. I'm no different than anybody else. But you know what? When God grabbed hold of me and he grabbed hold of my heart and said, man, I want to teach you some things about you. And he did. And in ways that I didn't enjoy at all. But by being obedient to him, he's taught me that it's not about me. I'm here today bringing God's message to all of you because it's not about me. It's about what God wanted me to do and when he wanted me to do it. And no matter how bad I fought it, he kept showing up and pushing and pushing. And you get tired of it, so you just move, right? God's pushing somebody here today. In the same way he pushed me, he may not be pushing you to be a pastor. He may not be pushing you to be in leadership. But he's pushing you to be a disciple for Christ. He's pushing you to share God's word with somebody else that needs to hear it. And don't be ashamed of it. People tell me all the time, oh, man, I can't do that. That feels so uncomfortable. You know, I told the guys today, we're men. Men are the worst. They're fixers. Me as a man, all men, they want to fix things. Every time it gets screwed up, they want to fix it. We can't fix anything. We can help in the process, but God himself is the fixer. God himself is the one that's going to repair everything that we have damaged in our lives and everything that's damaged in somebody else's lives. We are just the tool in the vessel. But are we being used in that way? You know, we hang on to stuff. We hang on to stuff in our lives and we hang on to regrets. And we stay mad at God because we can't let go of the stuff in our life. We want to drag it around with us. We want to blame God and blame others for everything going on in our lives. But if you hit your knees and you pray to God and say, I know you're there. I know you're the only one that can clean this up. I know you're the only one I can dump this on and get rid of it. Take it from me and change my life. You want your life changed, that's what you need to do. And I'm a witness. God can change lives. I see it in this church every day. I see it in my own life and my own kids and my own grandkids because I'm setting the example for them. I'm not slipping up and saying that foul word over here every once in a while for them to hear. I'm not raising my temper and getting mad and acting a fool in front of them. And I don't do it behind them. If I did, my wife would slap me upside the head, right? Y'all know my wife. Then I got to hit my knees because it'd be hard to get up. But I know God's with me. And I know that's not the way God wants me to act. And I told you, she always throws it at me. She always throws it at me. Would that be pleasing to God? I hate that. Because she's right. So I get very little opportunity to slide off the to the side there, you know, she, she's part of my team. She keeps me on the straight and narrow just like God. But that's because she's a godly woman. You should be the same way in your marriages, in your friendships, in your kids' lives, grandchildren's lives. You should be that way. Walk the talk. Walk the walk and talk. If you can talk the talk, walk the walk. Isn't that what I'm trying to say? But are you? You know, I get disturbed every time I come and visit with kids here in the youth. I visit with kids sometimes from children's church. They come and talk to me. You know, they're really sad, and they, they ask me, hey, would you pray for my dad that's just getting out of jail? Would you pray for my mom and dad that's ha- they're fighting all the time? Pray for this person, this person, with all this stuff going on in their lives that children should not even see in the first place. Is that setting the example for God? If you're doing that today, you need to clean that up. That's not from me. That's from God. 
I'll tell you second, clean it up. It's not a legacy you want to leave behind. It's not what your kids need to carry on in the future. If we're going to instill God back in this country and in this world, then it needs to start right now, today, right here with us in what we're doing. If you're letting someone else raise your kids, if you're dropping them off at church and you're not walking in the door, you're not part of their events that are going on in church, you're not encouraging them, then you're wrong. They don't need you just part-time. They don't need a part-time parent or part-time friend. They need a full-time parents and full-time friends. It's got their back. We have a misguided world. And we got to work at it, building that foundation more and more. Turn with me to Psalms 127, please. Psalms 127, verse 1. It says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand and watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring are a reward from him. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. But blessed is the man whose quiver is full of them. Well, let's define that a little bit. In this scripture, God's word gives us three word pictures that helps us build families that have a heart for God. Real simple, three word pictures. We are to be workmen, we are to be watchmen, and we are to be warriors. The goal of all three of these roles is to leave a legacy of godliness to our children, our grandchildren, and generations to come. In Psalms 127, we realize that the workman is not building a physical house. He's building a home, a heritage, a godly family line that will take heart in the ways and faith of God and carry it into the next generation. The workman leaves behind a model of godliness that people will embrace in the next generation. In Psalms 127, we also realize that there needs to be a watchman. The scripture says, unless the Lord guards the city, the watchman stays awake in vain. We can picture here a sentinel or a guard, someone who has been assigned and accepted the responsibility of standing ground over the city. He can't go to sleep on his shift. He's got to stay alert and awake. He needs discernment, though. He needs discernment of the heart to recognize when the enemy is coming. And we all need that. We need to realize there is an enemy. As the Bible says, the devil roams around looking for someone to devour. So we need to be on guard for that. We need to be ready and awake and watchful over our children, our grandchildren, our family, and our friends. We need to pray for them daily. We have been given an assignment of being protectors, not fixers, protectors, looking out over the city that God has entrusted to us, and we're talking about your family. The third picture we see in Psalms is that of a warrior. It says, like arrows in the hands of, of a warrior are children born in one's youth. The picture here is a battlefield, and our sons and daughter are, daughters are the ammunition. There are the arrows in battle. And God intends that we release, big word, release and send them out into the culture. And you know what that's like in today's society. Those arrows, though, they have to be prepared. They have to be carefully shaped and formed. They have to be shot in the right direction toward the appropriate target at the time. Our effectiveness as warriors, in many senses, determines the effectiveness of our arrows. Amen? If they're not shaped correctly, if they're sent in the wrong direction, 
they're not going to fulfill the purpose of God. Kids are being sent into battle today, not prepared. Not prepared at all. Not prepared to deal with today's culture or society. God is not instilled in their heart. You know, we may have God in our head. It's not that far from there to there. But how do we get God from our head to our heart? God's word, God's grace, and God's mercy that we sometimes take for granted. The psalm tells us that there's a house to be built, a city to be guarded, and a battle to be fought. God is building his kingdom, not ours. And we are workmen with him. We are watchmen with him. And we are warriors with him. Amen? The purpose of God for our families, homes, and relationships is that through our little part of the building process, we are contributing much to the larger building process of the kingdom. Amen? It's through this means right here that we will leave a legacy of godliness for the next generation to come. If we lose sight of that vision anywhere in our lives, we're going to be weary in doing the good things that we need to do. Is your vision pointed toward God and God's will and His kingdom? Or is your vision pointed toward earthly things? It's going to make a difference in your life and your legacy to come. Remember, we are just a mist. Just a mist. A little puff of smoke. Here one minute, gone the next. Is the legacy that you're leaving behind the sweet smell of spring flowers? Or is it that awful smell of a skunk? Proverbs 13. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children and his children's children. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to be here this morning. We thank you, God, that you reached down this morning and woke us up in a good way. With your love, your grace, and your mercy, you show upon us. Father, we know you've got something good for us today, Father, and we pray that you'll reveal that in our lives as our struggles go on in the, on this earth. Father, we pray that we reflect you in everything we do. And Father, that we continue to build that legacy of love that you have provided for us to our children, grandchildren, and generations to come. Father, we pray that you guide us, you direct us, and you scold us when we fall down, Father, that we stay on the straight path that you have designed for us. Father, let us seek your word and your will in everything we do, not our own. And Father, I pray that you be with each and every one as they leave here today. Father, I pray that the blessings of thanksgiving just abound everywhere with everyone. That we take time to reflect and give thanks for all the things we do have and stop whining about the things we don't. Father, we love you, we praise you. And Father, today I pray that everything we said, everything we did here today was pleasing, uplifting, glorifying to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Folks, I'm going to ask for a prayer from you today. I'm leaving here Tuesday to gather with my children and my grandchildren in Red River, New Mexico, all in one cabin. We're going to ride together all the way up there in three different cars. I need lots of prayer. This is the first time our family's been together more than one day at a time in the holidays. We're going to be there a week. Keep us in prayer. Love you guys. Thanks for being here.